Today's scripture reading comes to us from the book of James, second chapter, verses one through nine. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while the one who is poor, you say, stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, which is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, the star belly sneeches had bellies with stars. The plain belly sneeches had none upon vars. And that detail is pretty much all you need to know about this story, this wonderful, whimsical Dr. Seussian story that subverts our norms and makes us think about who we are. It sets up the entire conflict, this one superficial difference. The Sneetches are these Seussian creatures that you see in this image. They are Maybe they're birds, I don't know. Are they birds? They, they kind of have bills. They look like they might have feathers. They have these long necks. And, and then they have these round bellies. And on some of those bellies, there are little green stars. And on some of these bellies, there are none. And that is the only difference, literally, between those two groups. However, in this story, it is more than just a difference. In this case, it is also a value judgment. There's a book called The Gospel According to Dr. Seuss, which resides on Kevin Macbeth's bookshelf, and he was gracious enough to loan it to me for this series. The author of that book, James Kemp, says this, Not only did the star-belly sneeches think that they were better than the plain bellies, but also, and this is perhaps the greater tragedy, the plain belly sneeches thought so too. Although they were despised by the star belly sneeches, sneeches, they wanted to become them. And so enter into the conflict one Sylvester McMonkey McBean. Now it needs to be said that this character in the story does not care at all about the sneeches. He sees their conflict as an opportunity to make some money. He exploits their conflict for his own gain, for his own profit. He says to them, I've come here to help you. I have what you need. And my prices are low. There it is, right there, right? There it is. And my prices are low. I work at great speed. My work is 100% guaranteed. Sylvester refers to himself as the fix-it-up chappy. He is going to fix this situation. So he sets up a, a machine Uh, And the purpose, the function of this machine is one thing. It's simply to put green stars on sneech bellies. And he charges the plain belly sneeches $3 to walk through this machine and have a star stamped on their bellies. And they all do so. They pay their money, they walk through the machine and have a green star stamped on their bellies. Now, of course, there is a different problem. (laughs) A different conflict because the original star belly sneeches still believe that they are superior. But now, there's just no way to tell the difference between the two. Well, no, no problem, no worries, as it turns out, just so happens, that Sylvester has a second machine. The second machine, the way it fix, 
fixes problems is by taking stars off of snitch bellies. And so um, Sylvester sets up the second machine and, and promises the original star belly sneeches that he's going to fix the problem. He says, I'll make you again the best sneeches on beaches and all it will cost you is $10 eaches. Because you know inflation, you just got to consider for, for that. It's just... So the stars are removed. They pay their money gladly. They walk through the machine and their stars are removed from their, from their bellies. Uh, and now... The trend on the beach is that, is that plain bellies are considered the superior snitch belly. And, and of course, what happens next is that chaos ensues, right? Because now every snitch is wanting to go through every other machine. And they're, they're throwing money at Sylvester as they go through their machines, having, having stars taken off their bellies, having stars added to their bellies. And, and, and all of them are just running around randomly all over the beach, running through Sylvester's fix-it-up machines. And, and ultimately, at the end of, of the story, the action stops when the snitches run out of money. They can no longer pay Sylvester anything, and, and they have no idea who is who. They are completely confused. They don't remember who was originally a star belly, who was originally a plain belly. They don't remember which one is better. They have no way to distinguish themselves from one another. They have no way to make any distinctions between them. As it turns out, Sylvester folds up his machines and rides off the beach with his buggy full of money. Because all he needed from them was for them to stay mad at one another long enough that he could make a profit. Exploiting their point of conflict so that he could gain. And he laughed as he drove his car up the beach. They never will learn. No, you can't teach a sneech. However, it turns out Sylvester was wrong because the Sneetches do learn something from this mess. They do learn something from what Sylvester did to them. That day, all the Sneetches forgot about stars and whether they had one or not upon Vars. They do learn. They realize how foolish they had been. They realize they had been manipulated. They realize they had been exploited. They had been objectified by Sylvester as just a source of income. Now, and these sneeches, forgetting about their stars and realizing what Sylvester had done to them, is actually a cornerstone of a, a branch of Christian theology known as liberation theology. Liberation theology arose in South and Central America and, and uh, came from the philosophy of a guy named Paulo Freire who talks about this idea of conscientization, which is simply, it's a big, huge word, but it simply means the process of becoming aware of how you are being objectified by the world in which you live, by the systems in which you live. Many of us, many of us have seen uh, a documentary that's very popular these days about how online presence, how social media and other websites manipulate our choices to sort of just guide us and force us into one mode of being, right? Becoming aware of that manipulation and exploitation, and not just becoming aware of it, but also working to break through it, that's the process of conscientization, where those who are being oppressed not only become aware that they are being oppressed, but they actively take part in their own redemption, in their own liberation. Freire's book is called Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and says, he says, no pedagogy which is truly liberating can remain distant from the oppressed by treating them as unfortunates and by presenting for their emulation models from among the oppressors. The oppressed must be their own example in the struggle for their redemption. In other words, the Sneetches were never going to resolve their conflict by using Mc Sylvester's machines. The Sneetches were never going to resolve their conflict using Sylvester's machines, because he was the one oppressing them. He was the oppressor in this story. He was the one taking advantage of their conflict, exploiting their disagreements. Their reconciliation, their redemption, it only happened when they realized that they were being manipulated. As Audre Lorde says, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Or as Seuss puts it, the day they decided that sneeches are sneeches, and no kind of sneech is the best on the beaches. That day, all the sneeches forgot about stars and whether they had one or not upon thars. 
Today's reading from scripture that Tom read a little bit ago comes from the book of James, and it is kind of a case study in the spiritual implications of making these distinctions among people, the the faith implications of what happens when we do this, when we engage in this kind of stuff. It's one of the latest additions to the Bible, the book of James. It was added to the Bible in the second century in the Eastern church, not until the fourth century in the Western church. It's a relatively short book. It's intended to be read by the entire diaspora, all the Christian Jewish um, churches all around the area, not written to a specific church to address a specific issue. It's kind of a a teaching document. It has um, 59 imperatives, 59 instructions. It's 108 verses long. So over half of the verses include some kind of instruction, very practical, very ethical instruction. We know James. We know this guy. He is the, he's the doers of the word guy. He's the one who says you should be a doer of the word and not just a hearer of the word. James's content challenges us, right, to, to reflect on how we're living our lives in the world and whether the way we're living our lives in the world actually represents what we believe, right? Faith without works is dead, That's James. And you can hear that in this particular passage for today. Starts with a rhetorical question. He asks us, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ? You can hear it in that question, that direct connection between belief and action. Do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe? And it's not just, hey, I've noticed your actions don't really align with your belief. James is challenging whether or not we actually believe at all. James is asking us, have you even heard of Jesus? Because I can't tell by the way you're living your life. Do you really believe at all, given that you act in this way? And the actions that he describes, that case study, are, are acts of partiality, acts of discrimination, acts of prejudice, where a decision is made about a person based on a superficial difference, based on one particular characteristic. In this example, whether one is rich or poor. You treat one who is rich in a different way than you treat one who is poor. Challenging us with these questions, he goes on to ask, you know, didn't God actually choose the poor to be rich in faith? Didn't I hear Jesus say something about that in that Sermon on the Mount, in those Beatitudes, like, blessed are the poor, for they will inherit the kingdom of God? And another rhetorical question he poses, in fact, isn't it actually the rich, he says, and isn't it actually the rich who oppress you, who take you to court, and who blaspheme the name of the Lord? Isn't, Isn't that the case? In this series of rhetorical questions, it's like he's asking us, haven't you ever read the Sneetches? Don't you remember what Sylvester did to them? Of course, these questions are linked together to get us to think think about uh, and learn about um, how we choose, how we decide to treat other people, how we decide to engage with the world based on nothing more than the differences among us, right? If we notice the difference among us and it affects how we treat people, we need to think about that. James will call our awareness to, to how we are being manipulated by, by oppressive systems to look at certain people in certain ways, Right? James will challenge us to act then in a way that actually aligns with our belief, demonstrating our trust in God alone rather than in the the fix-it-up machines of this world. James is asking us, in the words of our poet laureate Amanda Gorman, to lift our gaze, to lift our gaze not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. James' teaching on impartiality continues in the very next chapter when he talks about wisdom. James offers us a bit of wisdom instruction. Who is wise and understanding among you? Another rhetorical question, right? Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness and born of wisdom. There it is again, right? You claim to be wise. You claim to understand something about God. Show it. James is from Missouri, obviously. Show me, right? Show me what you believe. He goes on. Because if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth because such wisdom does not come down from above. It's earthly, 
unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Notice the contrast that James points out, the wisdom from above, the Sophia wisdom of God that that draws people together. And that wisdom from above looks like gentleness and peace and mercy and impartiality. In other words, the characteristics of living together in community, these are all relational words that pull us together, that characterize God's Sophia wisdom. James contrasts that with, with this earthly, unspiritual, devilish thinking that pushes people apart and it looks like envy and ambition and selfishness and boasting and dishonesty, all characters of of individualism, right? And again, there is nothing wrong with individualism. But we have to be careful because we cross a line when differences among people are more than just descriptive but become prejudicial, prejudging a person before you even get to know them based on one of those superficial distinctions, right? It reminds me of one of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's ideas published in 1958 when he wrote that men hate each other because they fear each other. And they fear each other because they don't know each other. And they don't know each other because they are often separated from each other. We're going to talk about fear in detail next Sunday. Today, let's talk about that separation, right? Because that separation that prevents us from knowing each other, that separation comes in many, many forms. I mean, we've all felt it in these past few months, right? Or is it a few years now? How long have we been doing the pandemic thing? Like 47 years? So we felt it because we're separated from one another. We're separated from community. We're separated from traditional ways of being together. We've had to think differently and that leads to feelings of separation. I know we've all felt that. But there are other ways that we separate ourselves from one another. I just want to pause and love this picture just for a second. That's one of my favorite pictures of all kind. We separate ourselves based on age and based on clothes we wear and based on all kinds of things. We feel that separation based on based on, well, maybe you feel separated from the community when you see people who are older than you in power and making all the decisions without any input from you. Or maybe you feel separated from the community when you see younger people who are doing things very differently than you did and very differently than you ever would, right? And that makes you feel a sense of separation or distance. Maybe you feel separation when people are dressed all sloppy and casual, they have holes in their jeans, novelty t-shirts with the sleeves cut off, right? Or maybe you're feeling separated from a community when people wear khakis and polos and they wear leggings as pants for some reason with Uggs and puffy vests. Not to be overly stereotypical, but maybe that's where you are. Maybe you feel disconnected when a worship service is led by an organ and a cantor. Or maybe you feel disconnected from a worship experience when it's led by a guitar and a drum set. We all have felt it. The point is we've all felt that same separation from community in one form or another. And when we feel that separation, it's hard for us to really know one another. When we do not know one another, we begin to fear one another. And when we fear one another, it becomes all that much easier to hate one another. And the spiritual forces of wickedness, the evil powers of this present darkness pounce upon that. Manchester UMC has a welcome statement that everybody loves. It's a welcome statement that's an attempt to sort of articulate these points of separation. All these different ways that people separate from one another, right? We try to list them off in this, in this welcome statement and to also announce a different way of being, right? To announce that that's not going to be us, that we're going to extend God's love and grace to all people, 
We're going to announce a way of being in which those earthly unspiritual separation points are transcended. We're going to announce and embody a, a way of being that in which we lift our gaze to what stands before us together, not sta what stands between us. A way of being that, that embraces our differences as diversity, as strength. We extend God's love and grace to all people and we get this. I know that we get this because it's not that hard of a concept to understand. I mean, intellectually, the Sneetches is not a difficult story. Intellectually, the unconditional love of God is not that hard to get it. The welcome statement is, is great and we all love it. And at the same time, we must confess that it's very hard for us to put into action. As great as our welcome statement is, as much as we all love it, we still see those superficial differences. And we make judgments about individuals based on them and them alone, which is the definition of prejudice, of course, prejudging someone based on a, a difference before you even know them. And here's the thing, God sees those distinctions. God sees those differences. It's not that, that God does not see how we are diverse, that God does not see our differences, but God's gaze is lifted. And God's, God calls us to lift our gaze as well. No divine love is not colorblind. God's love embraces the entire spectrum. And that's what makes it so powerful. Unconditional love inherently resists oppression in the world because oppressive systems rely on us staying mad at each other based on those superficial differences. And when we refuse to do so, when we embrace instead the unconditional love of God made known in Jesus Christ and brought to life in the presence of the Holy Spirit, we rob those oppressive forces of their power. When we choose to live instead as if we mean it when we say, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we begin to lift our gaze as God desires. Because in this earth, in this world, there are a lot of beaches. And on those beaches, there are a lot of sneeches. And they are all beautiful. And they are all wonderful. And indeed, no kind of sneeches the best on the beaches. Would you pray with me, please? Oh God, you love us unconditionally. And for that, we are so grateful that no matter what character of your love, God, is what gives, what gives it its power. Because God, the spiritual forces of wickedness are present in this world, working on us, working on us to keep us divided, working on us to keep us apart and, and skeptical and fearful of one another. May we as your church embody that unconditional love in what we say as well as what we do. Maybe even in how we think about the world and one another. So that we might live up to the promises that are made in baptism. Promises to, by your love, resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves in the world. And at the same time, to embody grace, peace truth, justice, hope to be the church that you desire. We love you, Lord. We pray to you in the holy name of Jesus and wherever we are in the abiding presence of your Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.